Good afternoon to everyone and thank you for being here today. Uh, hoping that you had a great day today of teaching and learning and um, I want to commend you for joining us this afternoon after your busy day. Um, I just want to say um, that we appreciate this opportunity to kind of come together, talk, share, and learn, and share some information uh, regarding the plans for reopening our schools. I want to just again uh, reiterate that these are plans now and we're finalizing what proposals that we will be bringing forward. So welcome everyone and I want to thank all of our district managers who've been on these meetings uh, this is the third one this week and from late nights and all of those things. Thank you to the management team who also contributed to the presentation um, presentations that have been made this week. Let's go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> As we begin our conversation today, um, I want to just be able to share that um, there's been extensive planning, very strategic planning that's uh, gone into our many processes of trying to determine how to reopen our schools. Basically our mission, our theme this year, uh, embracing our mission, reimagined and redesigned is what we're all about. <clears throat> we know that our children are our greatest resource and we're committed to ensuring that they are safe and future ready. I just want to reiterate that we're going to rise to the occasion and we're going to meet the challenges that uh, we're currently faced. We're educators and we know what that means, that we have to continue to be flexible as we accomplish our mission to educate children in these very difficult, under these very difficult conditions. But I do want to reiterate that we are here to serve and we are here to serve together. Um, no big eyes and little U's, we're all in this together. And many hands make the load light, as an African proverb says. So we need each other. So I wanna thank you all for your work and all that you do to contribute to the success of our organization. Just wanna reiterate that uh, the Board of, Tru of, of Trustees and I are, are, are committed committed to ensuring that um, we maintain the health and safety of our students and our staff as we um, engage in opportunities to ensure continued learning. So before we go into the presentation, I'm going to ask Norma if she will just give us some navigational tools um, so that we can respond to any questions that may come up during the course of the presentation. Yes, thank you, Dr. Fisher. For today's meeting, we will be using the chat feature. Um, all of uh, the district team and Lupe will be monitoring the chat. If there are questions that we can answer um, right away in the chat, we will do that. We will also be scanning for questions that come up multiple times that we can stop throughout the presentation and um, offer some responses to that. So um, just please keep that in mind that that will be our, our method of um, uh, input for questions um, and responses. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Okay, and Ms. Uh, Ms. Norma, if you could follow up with Ms. Wood, she's having some trouble. If okay. Follow up with her, please, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, as we're moving forward to the next slide, I'm gonna take us back a bit. Next slide. Uh-oh, there we go. I'm gonna take us back a bit as we go forward. Um, we began planning for our reopening with our reopening task force, um, and that happened in early summer, late spring. We convened a, a group that included parents, teachers, district um, staff, both, both classified and certificated. Uh, it was a large task force, and then they broke up into subgroups, really delving into what schools might look like um, when we were able to reopen. And so the basis of our discussions now are rooted in the original um, guidelines that we planned for. But all through that planning process, we were always careful to say, things will be subject to change based on the current public health conditions. So I, I just want everyone to be clear that we're not recreating the wheel. We're looking at what our original plans were 
and modifying those plans based on our current conditions. So our planning has been in motion and very fluid. As you all well know, the same applies to our current public health conditions. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that later in the uh, presentation. Our guidelines were uh, comprehensive and we used many, many planning documents from the state and the uh, local levels um, to uh, make determinations about things to include in our reopening guidelines. So as things continue to change and as we know more, our guidelines will also be updated to reflect current changes. But I wanted to just say that the plans have been a very comprehensive and included uh, a variety of stakeholder uh, voices, input, and feedback, both classified and certificated. Next slide, please. So I'm taking us back again. This was the opening of school decision tree that we looked at in early August. When we initially, um, the task force initial, initially developed this tool, we were thinking that we would be able to open in a hybrid model. And instructional schedules and all of those things had been discussed, but we learned, uh, I think approximately early August, a week or maybe 10 days, if that, prior to the actual opening of school, we would have to trigger and pivot to a full online platform, complete distance learning. And that's what we did. So when we um, made that pivot in early August, just prior to the beginning of school, we indicated at that time that we would continue to monitor our options. And if situations in Fresno County improved, we'd come back to the table to see if we could um, make, uh, make decisions for modifying from online, online learning to a blended model if the conditions warranted that and um, based on our local input. So um, I just want to reiterate, this was always a part of our plan and it was um, vetted with our, our, our um, reopening task force with lots of input. And I know that um, it's not gonna be the same as 100% traditional learning, and that would be our ideal, but we're just not able to move in that direction at this time. So according to our decision tree, we would come back and take a look at what blended models might be uh, implemented as the county conditions improve. And then we also said, well, based on county guidance from, uh, guidance from the county health department, what would happen if they don't improve or what would happen if they improve and then there are outbreaks. So all of these things were included in our original planning. Next slide, please. So as uh, conditions continue to um, be monitored and continue to be in flux, what are those implications now for each of the local uh, districts? And uh, the implications specifically for Selma Unified, in order for us to reopen our schools for in-person instruction in any capacity, counties um, must uh, not be in the most restrictive tier, which is purple, but they have to move into the red tier. And this is the new system implemented by the governor with regard to monitoring uh, COVID-19 conditions uh, across the state. So you must move into the second most restrictive um, tier for us, that's red, and you must remain there. After moving in there for one meet, week, you have to remain for an additional two weeks for a, a complete period of 21 days in order to reopen schools in any capacity, okay? So, Fresno County entered the two week timeline on September 30th. So we began to monitor from September 30th, we, we moved into the red, but we have to stay in the red for 21 days and our numbers have to decline before schools are given the green light to uh, reopen 
or have students come back to class in any capacity. So what does that mean for us? What are our current choices right now? Knowing that we're in the red tier, but we're, we're still monitoring whether or not we can fully reopen. So for Fresno County Schools right now, because we moved into the red tier, our local uh, public health officials said we can now begin to consider applying for the elementary school waivers. When we were in the purple tier, they said, don't even apply because your numbers are too high. But once Fresno County moved into the red tier, our local public health officials said, you can apply, but we will look at your plan. We will evaluate your local epidemiological data and we will make determinations whether or not to grant your waiver. But we're eligible now because we're in the red tier. We are also able under current state guidelines to use what we call small group cohorts of students, um, providing networks of support for students demonstrated, demonstrating the highest level of need and the highest um, uh, risk factors for further uh, implication, negative implications on their uh, academics. So the small group cohort guidelines were developed by the state to provide a safety net while schools were still closed. So small group cohorts can operate, but under specific guidelines while schools remain closed. So that's an important distinction. Small group cohorts have a, a specific set of criteria and very specific guidelines that have to be in place. Um, and you can only operate under those conditions while uh, schools are still closed. The other option for uh, local school districts in Fresno County is to continue to offer virtual learning or distance learning for those families who opt not to return. Uh, it's strongly recommended that each local educational agency or each district also consider an option, a parent choice option for those families who opt not to return. So that just gives you an idea of some of the variables that we've had to consider as we're, um, our, as we're engaged in our planning. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit more about each of those options, okay? Next slide, please. I want us to take a few minutes to uh, look at the Fresno County data. I've shared earlier a bit that we have moved into the red tier. We were operating into the purple, in the purple tier and um, everyone engaged in um, uh, practices that would help to reduce the spread and bring down the number of daily cases. And so that's good. So we wanna get down to the yellow. That's where we'd like to get to so that we can um, fully function as a community and as a state and as a county, we want to be able to get down to the yellow. That's our goal. However, um, we've continued to monitor the data and Fresno County now has been moved to the red tier. So in each tier, you'll notice that there are um, criteria, data, data points that must be monitored within each tier. So if you look at the red tier, you'll, you'll see that we have an adjusted case rate and that's based on 100, uh, uh, per 100,000 uh, cases that were tested. And then we also have a positivity rate. The public health officials monitor both those rates to make determinations as to whether a county can move into another colored tier system. And the purpose for um, the governor um, reevaluating the system for monitoring um, COVID activity 
is that they're trying to reduce and avoid the ping pong effect of opening and closing and opening and closing. So the epidemiologists and the scientists and the, um, uh, the uh, health professionals work to come up with a, a model that would help to mitigate um, spread, of course, and also to reduce moving in and out and opening and closing and, and so forth. So currently, we looked at when we first moved into the red tier, things looked really good. And that's what our first set of numbers show here. <clears throat> as, I sh as I shared, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll move into each tier, but you have to remain in that tier for 21 days. And they'll monitor your numbers for 21 days before you can really reopen schools in that red tier. So we, we met our first benchmark back on September 30th. And you could see that our adjusted case rate came down to 6.2. That landed us squarely in the, substan the, the red range. And our positivity rate came down to 4.9. So that landed us in the red range squarely. Close, but we were close to five, but we landed in there. So we were happy about that. And then superintendents, uh, we meet weekly and we meet with the public health officials and the state officials and they give us indicators and they talk to us about things. And they said, okay, you met your first criteria, but now you have to go another two weeks to meet your second benchmark criteria. And these benchmark criteria are analyzed weekly. Every Tuesday, a new rating will come out. But we're looking at our numbers in two week spans for schools. So yesterday, well, Tuesday, they gave us our second rating for schools. And that's what you see in the second set of criteria that are listed here. Our data is a little volatile at this time. While we've so shown some decreases in our positivity rate, which is good, we're showing fewer people uh, testing positive. So we know that there are some improvements being made. However, our daily rate of, of tests per 1,000 each um, is increasing. We, we increased from 6.2 to 7.1. So our data is a little bit, um, it's not consistently declining, but we're showing improvements in our positivity rate. So what does this mean for us? Well, according to the state system, you must be squarely in in both of these ranges for 21 days to be able to open schools. We'll know if we're going to maintain in these ranges for 21 days by October 13th, which is this coming Tuesday. So we're all watching those numbers with bated breath to make sure that this adjusted case rate does not increase but that it continues to decrease and that our positivity rate continues to um, decrease or remain in that range. Our positivity rate looks really good. It's coming down and it's, uh, it's in the orange category. So great job to everyone who's supporting all of the things that we need to do. Um, this information uh, was taken from the, the, dish, the county website on yesterday, and we were uh, informed by the uh, county public health official that they're still in discussions with the state officials with regard to some flexibility or some volatility in our data. But this is the data that superintendents were given so if there's been some updates uh, since Tuesday, um, we, were shared, we were informed by our local public health official 
that they're still trying to work through some discrepancies at the state level. So there's, there may be still a little volatility in this data, but we will know on October 13th whether we will firmly be able to um, reopen our schools. So uh, those of you who are statisticians or mathematicians, you know that sometimes data can fluctuate uh, based on many variables. And so that's why they don't really take um, readings and give us indicators. Um, th that's why there's usually a seven day span to be able to give us uh, indicators or updates on indicators because there can be volatility between uh, the, collect the collections of the data. So this is the latest data superintendents were given on Tuesday and we will get another reading on next Tuesday, I believe at noon or by one o'clock. So, what I want to do, what, re reiterate at this point, um, if schools are able to open on Oct October 13th, and if our numbers stay in this range and continue to show decline, we are told at this point that um, schools do not have to reclose if the county moves. If we reopen, schools will not be required to close, but we will have specific um, criteria and specific metrics and specific conditions that we have to follow if there are outbreaks or if things happen within our communities. But there will not be at this point a requirement to fully reclose schools if they are in fact given the opportunity to reopen. I know that's a lot, but I wanted to just give you the basis for, for um, our conversation and why we're considering reopening and what our options are as we're moving forward. I saw your comment, uh, Norma. Yes, Dr. Fisher, just wondering if you wanted to stop um, and ask sure. that. your questions. Uh, just let us know when you're ready. Okay, we can, we can stop here and I can see if I can answer any, any data related questions. Okay. Um, just looking through back those quite through the questions. I think there was a question um, regarding um, is reopening is the reopening date at a district's discretion. Um, the reopening of schools will be well reopening of schools period is at the district's discretion, even though the county might give us the green light to to reopen the decision to reopen is that of a local school district. And it is of the district's discretion if they're going to reopen, what that reopening date would be. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I think for now we can keep going and we'll keep scanning for other questions. Very well. Let's go to the next slide, please. So as we're considering what our options are, these are some key considerations that um, all districts must take into consideration as they're doing their planning. On September 24th, our local uh, public health officials in conjunction with uh, state officials updated our return to school or um, guidelines for K-12 settings. And so we use this um, to be able to give us uh, clear and specific guidelines to support the health and safety of students and staff, as well as the community. It gives us an opportunity to make sure we're clear about our instructional programs and what we need to do to make sure that we have protective measures in place and that we maximize the power of prevention when, when and if we, rec we re reopen schools. So there are very specific guidelines as to how schools and local communities will respond when schools are reopened. 
And this is the guideline that provided uh, us with that information. It includes all of the safety features that have to be in place on campuses and in district uh, facilities. And it also provides information on um, various scenarios, if there are conditions or outbreaks or if someone's been exposed, a uh, step-by-step process for what we have to do um, to be able to address any concerns that would come with um, any um, exposure. So these are the key considerations and this was the basis that, uh, of guidelines that we use to make those considerations. Okay, next page. So this just gives us, um, Norma's gonna talk a little bit about uh, the scenarios and what we're gonna go into a little bit further. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Yes, um, so what Dr. Fisher has laid out for us um, then brings us to, so what are the possible scenarios for Selma Unified? So what we are looking at is um, there are a couple of uh, possible scenarios that we're looking for Selma Unified. One is the um, creation of small cohorts. Uh, we'll talk in more detail what exactly does um, constitutes a small cohort and what might that look like. But we are looking at um, bringing on small cohorts of students, um, beginning with um, STC students at some sites, and then possibly additional students. The other scenario that we're looking at, and Dr. Fisher, um, I believe addressed it, is applying for a waiver for our TK through sixth grade um, and the possibility of bringing those students on back onto campus in a hybrid model. We are also at the same time, so we're working on small, court, small cohorts, submitting a waiver to the county, but we're also waiting to see what happens with um, the county of Fresno. Um, and then the final scenario that we have available to us, of course, is to continue distance learning for those students whose parents select to continue in distance learning. So those are the four possible scenarios that we're going to discuss today. Right. Um, and if Norma, and if, I could, if I could just interject on the county reopening, that will be looking at K-12 because there may be some districts that uh, are small enough to bring back their secondary. So that county reopening guideline will be looking at K-12 schools. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Sure. Okay, next slide, please. So, so we're gonna talk just a little bit um, specificity and I, I see that there are questions. And so again, uh, we're all scanning those, um, but we may be able to answer the question, some of the questions as we go through the presentation. So in reference to those small group cohorts, we're looking at um, a fa two phase process. Phase one would uh, invite students in special day classes from Wilson Indianola, the middle school, Selma High School, and the Eric White SDC program. Um, those students who, uh, whose parents elect to participate in the small cohorts would come on campus Monday through Friday. And in a later slide, we're gonna talk about the specificity, what would that look like? Um, of course, phase one for elementary um, SDC cohorts would end if we were to reopen in a hybrid model at the TK6 grade level. We are also planning a phase two of small cohorts. Um, phase two, first of all, would be implemented at all school sites, but there's a little caveat there. For secondary sites, um, secondary starts sites will begin planning for um, small cohorts in phase two that would begin November 2nd. And these would be in addition to students from the SDC classrooms at the secondary sites. These would be students who were um, selected based on specific needs, students who are still struggling with connectivity issues in their homes. Um, English learners, newcomers, students who are having a tremendous amount of difficulty keeping up with schoolwork and grades. The, um, the secondary sites would select those focused students that would be invited to come onto campus for small cohorts beginning November 2nd. At the same time, elementaries are planning for the possibility of bringing on phase two cohorts. The only, the only way that elementary schools would bring on phase two cohorts would be if the district's waiver were not approved and the county were not allowing any reopening of schools. So if those two options are taken off the table, 
then our elementaries would then enact those uh, phase two small cohorts. So those are two, two pieces, two movie pieces in all of this. Um, at the same time, we are also then working to um, establish the plan to bring on TK through sixth grade students in a hybrid model and a blended learning program starting November 9th. We're looking at TK and kindergarten students being offered the opportunity to come on campus four days a week, Tuesday through Thursday, in a AM PM uh, schedule. Then we're also looking at grades first through sixth grade, offering those families the opportunity to come into a blended learning program where students would attend two days a week on campus and three days of distance learning. Of course, we already mentioned for our SDC students, um, if they were in small cohorts, we would then offer our SDC students at the elementary level the opportunity to come onto campus four days a week for a full day program. While all of this is in motion, our seventh through 12th grade campuses would hold in distance learning with planning going into effect to bring back students um, for a hybrid model starting the second semester in January. So these are the, these are the kind of the four tracks that we're, we're working on um, at the same time in the reopening of schools. Right, and if I could just interject, um, the hybrid blended learning model, again, from our opening slide, was always under consideration because of our need to do social distancing and to implement all of the public health uh, conditions, um, that uh, public health requirements. So hybrid learning and blended, the blended model was always a consideration um, when we're able to bring students back, unless we fully move to uh, traditional, which we don't know when that's gonna be, maybe after the vaccine. <laughs> okay, next slide. Uh, next we have Dr. Lingo with us. Hello, so how did the small group cohorts come about? And I know many of you have been aware of this and saw our previous presentations, but as you know, the California Department of Public Health basically um, initiated these guidelines again to help us allow for supervision and limited instruction of specified students requiring that more assistance. So what does a cohort look like? It cannot exceed 14 students and two supervising adults or a ratio not to exceed 16. So for some of our students who have more, um, need more support per se, such as our students in our special day classes, it may be only five students with four adults working with them and helping them to access their education. Um, obviously, cohorts cannot interact. Um, they basically will be in an area and that area they will stay in. That's where they will receive their meals. If they do do any type of outside activity, they will stay within their cohort. They will not intermix with other cohorts. Adults and children will definitely practice appropriate um, distancing and super distancing during this process, um, as well as this will allow for specialized academic surface, specialized services to come out and actually work with some of those students as well. So if we have students who are receiving OT or speech and language, they will have an opportunity to be pulled out, which is granted through the Department of Health and be worked with in the in one on one setting. All right, and the next slide, please. So Norma went through sort of the phase one and the phase two and how it looks. So, but basically with that, um, just some of the things that have come up is that teachers will not, teachers will not be providing the direct instruction in the room. Instruction will still continue virtually. Um, students coming to school for small cohorts will continue to log in and receive their instruction again from their teacher. Classified staff will be on campus and will be supervising students in that classroom. And again, the student to adult ratio, again, will be based on the needs of the students and how much support they will need. Cohorts will not be allowed to intermingle, as I said, and we're looking at parents doing the transportation, again, just to help keep contact down and helping um, our transportation department not have to sanitize the bus with each group of students that come through. Breakfast and any other meals would be served in the classroom and then at the end of the day students would do a lunch, a grab and go lunch supper to take home. So those are just the components of how the small cohorts will be looking at this time. And 
Any other comments from um, our team to add that I might have missed? Um, I, I just like to um, say that we have developed a small group cohort guidelines and that is the link that's listed there. And that information uh, will also be shared uh, on our website as we're moving forward. Um, I want, I want um, our, our everyone to know that we did receive questions from uh, Suda and we, uh, I reviewed the questions specifically and made contact with district staff to make sure you are including responses to some of those questions during this presentation. There were questions about the small group cohorts. And so we wanted to make sure that through this presentation, the, the questions that you asked specifically, uh, would the teachers be working with the special day class students or would they be classified staff? It may or may not be the classified staff that those students uh, would traditionally work with. We don't know until we know who those students are who are going to opt to return. So some of your questions that were submitted by Suda will be uh, responded to during the course of the presentation. And those that are not responded to, we will uh, work together as a district team to get those responses back to Suda leadership uh, so that uh, you all can um, make sure you have your questions answered. Our goal is to be able to work together. We can't do this without you. We need each other. Uh, many, many districts in Fresno County have already moved to small group cohorts and they look different uh, based on where you are. So uh, this is not just something Selma is doing, um, actually it's happening across the state. And that was the whole purpose for the small group cohort provision because parents are saying, I, my students are just not able to access any instructional, um, uh, their, their, their quality of instruction is just too difficult. They need a little bit of some, uh, support. Maybe it's just a point and click. Maybe it's pointing to what the teacher is telling them during the distance learning. Maybe it's just making sure that they, um, their headphones are on and they maybe might need some clarification in Spanish. This is just an opportunity to provide supervision and instructional support as the classroom teacher is delivering the uh, lesson. So I just wanted to highlight the small group, small group cohort guidelines and we'll have those available, uh, the link up on the website for you to review as well. I'm gonna ask if you would just very quickly, whoever's operating the um, presentation, if you just quickly click on that link if it's live, I just want them to see what it's going to look, what it will look like. And it is very clear, all of the elements and the safety precautions, I don't know if it'll come up, all of the elements and the safety precautions, definitions, selection of students. So if you have questions that are unanswered throughout the presentation, you may also click on this guideline to give you a further clarification. Okay. Thank you, Norma. Let's move on to the next slide. We're going to speak now about the elementary education, uh, the elementary waiver option. And um, I see that we have one person that's raising their hand. I just want to make sure it's not a technical issue. So, okay. uh, Jerry, so Jerry, I'm going to unmute you just to, to make sure it's not, um, let's see, how do I, how do I allow you to... Can you hear me? Oh, yes, there you go. Okay, that was a technical issue. I <laughs> couldn't figure out how to make the little screen bigger, but someone else answered me in the chat and I appreciate whoever that was. So I got it. Thanks for checking on me. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Okay, so um, we've, we've talked about the district applying for a waiver. So we've been working on that waiver. There are very specific things that we are required to respond to in the submission of that waiver. And these are the things that we um, are addressing within that waiver that will be submitted to the County Health Department. And I, I saw that there were questions um, about some of those things. So we will also be sharing the waiver application to inform everyone that we've applied for it. So there will be information um, in that um, 
that form. And then Mrs. Wood is also going to talk about site plans that address the, some of the safety and health features for each of our campuses. But we did have to address um, cleaning and disinfection uh, that will occur between those A and PM sites, uh, A and PM groups coming in for kindergarten and for those uh, AABB cohorts. We also address in our plan what the plan is for entrances and exits on our campus to limit the congregation or passing of large numbers of, of students or parents. So each school is working on what would that look like. Um, also keeping in mind that um, we do, we will have reduced numbers of students on campus and the only students coming to campus are those whose parents select that option. So um, we'll talk at the end about a parent survey. So we're talking about reduced numbers on campuses to begin with. We're also, we also must address face coverings for both adults and students. Um, what will health screenings for both students and staff consist of? And then um, something that we um, have to address also is identification and tracing of contacts if we were to have um, COVID cases on any of our campuses. And something new uh, that the county, all, dist all districts in the county have been working on, um, and Dr. Fisher has shared back with us, is um, testing of students and staff. And as a district, we're not required to conduct um, our own testing, but we have, the county has entered into a partnership with uh, local clinics to assist districts in the um, testing for staff and students, and of course, encouraging parents to utilize those facilities for testing in family and community situations. And then we also must address in our plan, what are the triggers for switching back to distance learning if we were to have COVID uh, positive cases on our campus. And then in addition to those areas that we have to address in the um, waiver, we also were required to provide information regarding consultation with our labor organizations, which is what we're doing today with both our CSCA and SUDA members. We also um, were required to have a consultation with parent and community, and that's what was um, happened yesterday when we met with our parents on both the Spanish session and an English session. And we also have to notify our grade level um, that we are proposing, which for us is going to be TK6, and what numbers we expect more or less for those groups. Hearing some back noise, those of you who are helping me, Lupe, I guess we find the the person who's um, thank you um, and then of course like I said once the waiver has been submitted I post that we are going to apply for the waiver if you could help us by making sure that you're uh, uh you're muted. yeah making sure that you're muted that would be great everyone thank you so, um, yes, uh, Norma, did you want to see if there are any waiver related questions? Yes, I'd, I'd like to find out where the noise is coming from. So, Lupe and, and Mark, if you're able to, did it stop? Uh, I can't tell. Mark and Lupe, can you tell whose mic is, is off or on? I'm working on it. Okay, thank there's, you. there's a lot of participants here that, that we have to try to click through. Okay, I'm scrolling down too and I, I'm not able to see. Okay, so let's see. Um, uh, and other team members, if you've spotted questions, if you could um, maybe assist with that. I know there's a lot of questions, Mrs. Wood, regarding the, um, the expectation for classified staff members to supervise students um, for any, any duration of time. Um, in those small cohorts. That question has come up several times. That question has come up um, there is a provision in the contract regarding um, a classified staff member not supervising in a classroom for more than one hour. Uh, again, we are currently negotiating with CSCA regarding small group cohorts and we've yet to uh, counter on that. Um, so we are working through some of these issues. Okay, thank you. Any other questions that our uh, team members see that have kept coming up? Our uh, team members see me that have that, that's, it's an echo. It's an echo. Um, I did want to also add that it's the it's the district's desire. 
uh, it's the district's desire to utilize classified staff members to help su supervise the small group cohorts, but we also have the latitude of uh, enlisting uh, parent volunteers, uh, volunteers from the community, but uh, we would uh, much prefer to use our classified staff in that capacity and uh, again, we're negotiating uh, in terms of compensation for that. Um, so that's our preference, um, but uh, again, we are right in the middle of negotiations. Thank you, Mrs. Wood. And I'm wondering um, if it's one of our... Norma, were you all done that uh, can go on to the next slide? And you're, uh, Mrs. Wood, you're sounding very, very garbled. Um, everybody, I... I Okay, um, I had to join late because I could not get Zoom on my laptop and um, uh, I'm on a Chromebook and I'm doing the best I can. So if someone wants to take my slides, please let me know because IT could not fix the issue. Okay, okay. Um, Stella's just invited me into her office. I'll pop over there. Okay, all right. That might have been that might have been the echo that we were hearing. So um, we'll give Mrs. Wood just a few seconds to pop over to um, Mrs. Duarte's office. I apologize for that, everybody. Am I? Okay. You're good. We can see and hear you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, as we consider any kind of reopening, okay. whether it's the small group cohort that been, or that might have been the echo that we were hearing. The, the small group cohorts or uh, reopening in general, uh, we had to develop uh, something that's uh, based on this COVID-19 industry guidance for schools and school-based programs. Every school site now has developed a COVID-19 prevention plan. Uh, they were finished in staggered amounts, so I know some sites already have theirs back from the print shop and uh, they've already been distributed. Whereas the last, uh, the last school just went to the print shop and those will be uh, due back very quickly, I'm sure. And um, so uh, enough of these were printed for every staff member to receive one. And uh, it's unique to each school site. Uh, there's also been a prevention plan developed for the employees who work at the district office and in the facilities around the district office like um, C2, C3, uh, child nutrition, IT, uh, the grounds uh, area, maintenance. Um, transportation has their own unique prevention plan uh, because what they need to do in terms of uh, cleaning and disinfecting on the buses, the number of students, socially distancing on the buses, that type of thing, they had uh, very unique provisions. Um, so in general, these plans were required to address uh, the number of students on campus, uh, our expectation of adhering to physical distancing, uh, requiring the face coverings for third through 12th, unless uh, someone is medically exempt, and also for TK through second grade, um, strongly recommended. Uh, we had to address uh, hygiene practices such as um, uh, coughing and sneezing etiquette, uh, hand washing, hand sanitizing. Uh, of course, we're uh, woven throughout the plan is uh, uh, safety for both staff and students. Uh, what we were doing to um, address cleaning, disinfecting, and uh, ventilation, and uh, what our plans are if um, a, a child or a staff member becomes uh, sick and they're diagnosed with COVID. In the plans, there are, uh, I believe, 10 different scenarios, and these were directly from the Fresno County Department of Public Health. Uh, what to do under numerous circumstances of exposure and positive cases. So we have plans in place for all of that. And um, uh, what all of you, if you've been reporting to a school site, what all of you uh, have been fully aware of since April, our uh, daily health screening for signs and symptoms, and that will also now include students as they come back on, on campus, uh, as well as any kind of visitors that visit the campus. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is speaking uh, specifically uh, to the TK through sixth grade hybrid model if we're able to uh, reopen. Uh, so this is not uh, involving the small group cohorts. 
Um, so with the um, transitional, transitional kindergarten and kindergarten students, uh, what we're looking at is an AM PM model four days a week. Um, so AM session would be from uh, 8.15 to 11.15. The PM session would be 12.15 to 3.15. Again, it would be Tuesday through Friday. Uh, first through sixth grade students would uh, operate in an AABB cohort model with Tuesday, Wednesday being one group of students uh, operating all day. Thursday, Friday being the second group of students or the B cohort, uh, again, uh, operating all day. And then um, uh, each opposite group would have three days of distance learning. Um, with the uh, SDC classes, uh, again, we're looking at four days a week, Tuesday through Friday. Uh, they would also be in full day sessions. Uh, our SDC classes are normally smaller in size and we can socially distance with a full uh, uh, class of students. Uh, for all of these groups, TK kindergarten, first through sixth, and SDC, Monday would be a distance learning day that would look very much like it does now. Um, one thing that uh, is it's very difficult to uh, explain and to understand, um, and I'm going to do the best I can on this, uh, inevitably, students may wind up with a different teacher with whom they have now. Uh, the reason being is we're giving parents two choices, one being stay on 100% distance learning or returning to school in a hybrid blended learning model. Um, so with that, conceivably, if you think of uh, four classrooms that have 24 students each in, in a first grade classroom and six students from each classroom uh, want distance learning, well, uh, that's another class of 24, but yet I don't have a teacher to become that distance learning teacher. Uh, so with that, any of those students who, uh, whose parents want distance learning, they would have to have a new teacher. We cannot have teachers teaching in a hybrid model and doing a complete um, uh, distance learning uh, uh, model at the same time. Um, so this is actually something that I put together and presented in negotiations with Suda today that explains it a little bit better. Thank you, Norma. I wasn't expecting that. That's a nice surprise. Thank you. Um, so you can see how uh, what the numbers look like if six students from each classroom um, uh, uh, wanted distance learning. And uh, the, the um, alignment got off a little bit, but it basically it says, uh, I have no teacher for the 24 students who, who want distance learning. So then um, 18, let's just say teacher D becomes the distance learning teacher. 18 of those students want in-person instruction. They would have to be divided up between teacher A, teacher B, and teacher C. So those 18 students are going to have a new teacher. Um, teacher D still has a class of 24, uh, but six students from teacher A, six students from teacher B, and six students from teacher C will come into that teacher's classroom. The, the six students who wanted distance learning, they still get the same teacher, but that teacher now has 18 different students um, than he or she started the year with. So very simply, students are going to have different teachers than they have now. Uh, that's what we're going to have to um, uh, get through if if parents choose distance learning and clearly they're going to choose distance learning uh, if that's an option um, because some parents aren't comfortable with sending their students back at this point. We're currently negotiating with Suda in terms of how is that distance learning teacher selected? Um, uh, you know, uh, what criteria is used to, to do that? We're right smack in the middle of negotiations and we also need very clear direction from the board, which we'll get uh, next Tuesday on that. But this is a very, very simple way of showing why uh, we might, uh, the students may wind up with a different teacher. Um, the, the thing is that everyone needs to understand, my world is never this perfect when it comes to staffing. Never do my numbers work out exactly where I've got 24, 24, 24, 24. Uh, it, just, it just doesn't work that way with staffing. Uh, so we'll again have to work through all the nuances of um, uh, the students uh, uh, who want distance learning. A question was asked in negotiations today in terms of 
do you see this crossing attendance boundaries? Absolutely, yes. I can't have a teacher uh, uh, teaching two students from Garfield, two students from uh, Eric White, uh, two students, uh, and let's say they're all second grade. Uh, I, I can't have a separate teacher for those two students. So yes, if, if students are going to be involved in distance learning, it will have to cross attendance boundaries within the district. Um, so again, we're working through uh, every possible scenario that we can with this. Um, next slide, please. Uh, again, uh, we spoke about some of the health and safety considerations that show up in the, the school prevention, the COVID preven prevention plans. Uh, one additional thing is that uh, foggers are going to be used daily. Um, uh, they're being used now as staff members leave who are reporting physically. Uh, after uh, students come back, uh, foggers will definitely be used for disinfecting. We spoke about the social distancing. We spoke about the face coverings. Um, one thing that's new uh, is that uh, temperature checks are now required. We do have no touch thermometers and we're looking at thermal scanners. Um, so um, we don't even have to use the actual thermometers, they're thermal scanners. Um, and uh, one of the questions that came up in the chat uh, was what constitutes an outbreak, like if there are positive cases in a, in a classroom. It's, um, uh, there is nothing that the health department is saying in terms of you have to shut down if uh, this happens. What they're saying is if you have two positive cases in a classroom, we're to contact the Fresno County Department of Public Health, or if there are three cases school-wide within a two-week period, we contact the, the Department of Public Health and we get direction because there's a huge difference in percentage between three cases out at Terry and three cases at Selma High School. So again, we'll take our direction from the Department of Public Health, um, our local agency. And now on the next slide, uh, we have all the site prevention plans listed there, as well as the prevention plan for the district office and transportation. You'll, you will see very definite, definite similarities between these plans because social distancing is the same wherever you go in the dis district. The requirement for facial coverings is the same wherever you go in the district. Hand washing is the same wherever you go. So there's a, a template that was developed and then sites made it unique based on who's handling risk management at the site. What are the uh, ingress and egress points at the site? Where's your isolation room located at your site? All of those things have been identified specific to each site, uh, but all of them have the required components. And uh, Dr. Fisher, that's it for my slides. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh, Mrs. Duarte's training places with uh, Mrs. Witt there. Okay, I was just, um, I was just gonna go back and ask if you would just click on one of the plans just so they could take a look. Just click on the link. Um, and, oh, Oops, sorry. Back, the other backwards. <laughs> just so that they can see what the prevention plan looks like. Um, and again, these links will be, uh, will these be posted on each school's website or will we have a, com a they all be posted on the district's website? probably both places, but I just, yeah, I just wanted them to be able to see the comprehensive nature of what's in the plans and our, um, uh, the things we have in place for monitoring um, compliance and implementation of the uh, preventative measures. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and Dr. Fisher, before um, Mrs. Duarte starts speaking, is there any, are there any questions we might answer at this time. Just um, are there questions related to the things that Ms. Wood just covered or are they questions that, um, I'm, I'm not following the question, so I don't know if they're trend questions. Um, I, I do want, I, I saw a couple of comments about, yes, this is, it's, it's gonna be a transition and, and, and it, um, um, it's not going to be easy. It's going to require, if, if we make the final decision to move in this direction, it will require some change. Um, however, if parents choose to have their children come back 
And depending on those numbers, how do we accommodate having uh, continued distance learning with the option for those parents to return? And that's what we're exploring now. Uh, I'll talk later about uh, whether affirmative decision um, has to be made. We're gonna go through where we are first and then I'll come back to that. Okay. Stella, if you would go ahead and present this information. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this uh, slide here was presented last night to our parents, uh, Mrs. Wood, uh, Ms. barajas Rees, um, and uh, Dr. Lingo have mentioned uh, the schedule here. Many of you have seen the schedule. We wanted to share this visual with parents last night to give them an indication of the schedule. Monday will continue to be a virtual day. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday will be the days that we will be face-to-face uh, -face if parents choose this option. We emphasize that this was a choice, that parents could choose to stay in distance learning or if they chose the in-person or face-to-face -face option, that this is what it might look like. We have indicated some times there, but as you see there, they are subject to change based on the site decisions and or transportation schedules. We did emphasize last night that these are proposed schedules and proposed times, knowing that we may need to be flexible based on each individual site's um, needs and again, transportation schedules. I know there were some questions there regarding why is there a change to kinder? I believe that in our first proposal, we wanted to provide AMPM for TK2. However, when we did in, uh, discuss that option, we did not have enough room uh, facilities. So we've modified that. And this is again, a proposal for TK and K. Originally, I believe it was a K2, but because of facilities, we now are proposing just TK and K. Dr. Fisher, would you like to make a comment yeah, regarding that? I would. Um, on our earlier proposal, just reiterating, there was a consideration for TK2, as you shared, um, and we, we don't have the staffing or the capacity to do that because each of those classrooms have to be divided into two. So that becomes uh, the need to hire more teachers and you'd have to have some place to put those folks. So we don't have the capacity to bring back all students TK2 four days a week. We, we just don't have the capacity to do that. So there were considerations, uh, there were concerns and considerations raised for our very youngest students. And so could we look at an AMPM model like the former, um, it, there, there was at one point AMPM kindergartens that were run. We looked at the instructional minutes and the capacity to be able to bring back those students at least four days a week for um, for the additional support our very youngest um, learners might need. And so that's why we had to uh, uh, reduce that option to TK2, excuse me, T, TKK, TKK. Yeah. And um, uh, we are aware that there are some other districts that are using that same model, the TKK uh, half day model A and PM because they have to be able to accommodate the social distancing and looking at the instructional minutes, as well as all the other things that have to occur uh, with regard to cleaning, disinfecting, and so forth between each session. Okay. Dr. Fisher, this is Mrs. Cooper, and if I may. I'm sorry. Um, this is, the, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Mrs. Cooper, and I do have a lot of concerns regarding the uh, uh, kinder schedule. Maricruz, um, Mrs. Cooper, Maricruz, you might have a, either two of the meeting going on, and so we were getting a, a big, big echo. Um, I don't, we don't mind unmuting you, but can you um, see if that's what was happening? And uh, Lupe and I will, will look for you and, and unmute you, but we'll, we'll try one more time. Okay, I think I got it. My husband uh, is also on, so he logged off so that uh -huh. it would go away. Yes. I can hear you now. Okay. You know, I, I, I apologize for interrupting the meeting, but I do feel that it is a, a great concern. The AMPN schedule for kinder, it's something that affects our um, contractual hours. It affects the schedule 
uh, as it's planned and it was proposed to the parents, um, we won't have a prep time. The, our Friday schedule is completely different. In the past, I, I've worked here in the district for several years and we did have AM, PM, but it was run by two certificate, uh, certificated teachers. Correct. The way the plan is proposed right now, it is not allowing for the prep time, lunch time, disinfecting. So I do believe, you know, why, why isn't uh, kindergarten, you know, I, why can't TK and kindergarten be on the same plan as uh, first grade or sixth grade? Thank you for uh, the, raising the question. We're, we don't have all the answers. We're just sharing what the proposal is now. We did get the questions from Suda and as an executive team, we're going to come back together to take a look at the questions and the suggestions that are being raised. That's the purpose for us having this time together. Um, so uh, Ms. Wood is making notes on, on that to be able to respond comprehensively. Um, we certainly want to make sure that we're doing things in alignment with the contract and certainly being able to um, stagger whatever staffing that needs to happen between across those AM PM sessions and also making sure that we're acknowledging the prep time and so forth. So those were questions that were raised on the uh, sheets that we received this morning from Roxanne. And so we'll be addressing and reviewing those as an executive team and we'll be able to respond back to you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, just, uh, you know, uh, students are supposed to be back in less than two weeks. And I do feel that, you know, we need to uh, receive some uh, clarifications on this issue so that we as teachers can be prepared to better serve our students. Mm -hmm. So I would really appreciate if we can get uh, some um, clarifications as soon as possible. Thank, Thank you. you. Most definitely. Um, so oh. are, we, go, are we ready to move on to the next slide, Dr. Fisher? So. Or Mrs. Dwight, I'm sorry. Um, yes, next here? slide. Okay. Um, this slide here, again, uh, we emphasize that parents do have the option to stay um, in distance learning. And um, here illustrates the uh, proposed starting dates. As mentioned earlier, October 19th, phase one, will go into effect with the small cohorts for SDC students from these particular sites. November 2nd, phase two, small cohorts for secondary sites. And, this is, and as Ms. Barajas Reese mentioned earlier, all schools TK6 will consider uh, phase two only if a waiver is denied and or schools are closed. Um, November 9th, currently that is our proposed start date for the TKK AM PM sessions and the blended model. And January 11th uh, is the 7th, 12th blended program proposal for the secondary sites. Again, these uh, are proposed start date times and we did emphasize to parents that they have the option of staying in distance learning or um, choose the proposed in-person schedules. Stella, there was a question with regard to um, the November 9th date, how that was a consideration? Yes. Um, originally, we were going to propose that they start all um, phases start on um, November 2nd, but since the trimester for elementary ends November 6th, um, we are proposing that we start the second trimester November 9th that would help with um, grading, the grading period. So that was our rationale for starting November 9th. It's the beginning of the second trimester. Okay. Um, there was a question, I just saw something fly over there about the SDC schedule. If you go back to the, the, the slide before Norma or whoever's controlling. There was a question about the SDC schedule. Again, I think it's it's listed there. Yes, and I tried to respond to it, yes. Okay, very well. Okay, let's move forward, please. So, um, the reopening of school plan next steps. Again, we are, we, we're not, uh, oblivious to the fact that 
this is quite challenging. It's quite challenging for all of us. And we're trying to make very difficult decisions with variables that um, we don't know uh, just yet. But we have to plan and we have to plan for different scenarios because we need time to be able to implement things even if we um, decide not to return until January. There are still things that will have to happen even if returning in January. So right now we are finalizing the parent survey and we shared with the parents last night that that survey would be coming out to them early in the week and that they um, need to let us know. We're gonna be surveying uh, specifically our elementary parents and um, just getting feedback also from secondary parents with regard to the decision to open at second semester. I believe Ms. Wood indicated that she is going to conduct a um, staff survey as well. Ms. Wood, are you, do you wanna say anything about that? I don't know if she can hear me. Oh, I, I don't know if you can. Uh, yes, we're planning on this survey. I need to keep it kind of short because of the, my microphone yeah. situation. Right. So, staff survey, we'll, uh, Ms. Wood is finalizing that. We'll be able to get that to you as quickly as possible. Remember, the key to whether or not we can reopen at all or whether we're going to have to continue with the small group cohorts. We'll, uh, we'll know on uh, October 13th. So that's a pivotal date for all of us. And then we'll have some recommendations and some further discussions at the board level on October 13th. We are uh, planning to submit the waiver uh, tomorrow. And then we have to wait to see if our county health officials will approve the waiver. Again, it is a local decision whether to reopen uh, schools in the community. And uh, we have teachers who are ready to come back. We have classified staff who are ready to come back. We have uh, students who are ready to come back. And we have those who are, ready, who are not ready to come back. So we know that we're dealing with, um, you know, um, lots of, of, of uh, folks who are all over the place in terms of their concerns and rightly so. And um, we're trying to make the best decisions. We, uh, it may be a decision that we will not reopen until January as an entire district. But right now there is a, a significant um, interest in bringing back our very youngest students which is our elementary students, because of the concern of the increased learning loss for those children, which is why the state offered the K-6 waiver. And if, if our numbers, uh, if we're approved, there will be a decision at this level to move forward, and this would be the plan that we're considering moving forward with. We will know more when we receive the surveys back because if, if uh, depending on those, the number of parents who decide, nope, I'm just gonna stay distance learning, that's gonna impact our staffing and how we're able to do the blended model. And so um, with that, I know that there were some questions that you had. We tried to answer many of the questions that we received, we received throughout the presentation and we've recorded the questions and the comments. We will go over them as an executive cabinet and then follow up with um, the responses uh, with our union leadership or send the responses back out um, by placing them on the website. We'll have to see which ones we didn't Dr. get to. Dr. Fisher, this is Roxanne. Hi, Roxanne. Hey, I, I have one uh, clarification on the survey that I think is really important. Uh -huh. There seems to be a lot of misinformation in the public about, uh, I see it on Facebook, uh, uh, you know, around Selma, Facebook, at News Around Selma. And one of the things I see a lot is there are parents who think that they are going to have, if they go to the hybrid model, they will have two days of in-face instruction 
and then they will have two days with a distance learning teacher. And I just, when you send out that survey, it needs to be very clear. They think that th that's why there was a lot of confusion. There was a lot of confusion on news around Selma about, well, then my kids, who will be their distance learning teacher after they're in the classroom for two days? So there are quite a few people, I think, who think that that distance learning, because we're calling it distance learning instead of calling it independent distance learning, because that's what it's going to be. They don't understand that. So just to make sure that that's really clear in the survey mm -hmm. and uh, really clear about some of the things about um, that this could result, this probably will result in kids being moved around in November. Right. Thank, right. thank you for sharing that. And I, I believe that we really wanted to reiterate that in both the English and the Spanish parent sessions because we want them to be aware that there will be three days of asynchronous independent time. And uh, how might we make sure parents understand that if they choose the hybrid model? I think it's just more that not everybody's at that meeting and then um, right. they start talking in the community right. and the message doesn't come through. So just on okay. the survey, when they answer the question, it, you may want to make sure it's very clear what mm -hmm. they're what they're signing up for. Uh, that, thank you, Roxanne. We'll do that, and it will be uh, uh, that's going to happen uh, whether we open now or whether we wait till January. So we do want to make sure parents are clear, even if we reopen in January under the hybrid model, there will be three days of asynchronous type uh, distance learning in an asynchronous. Um, environment where they're um, going to be working more independently and we're discussing having some discussions about what other kind of supports can be provided for students on those asynchronous days lots of things to consider um, and i really appreciate the comments and the information that we've received today um, and please know that this is our this is the only forum that we're able to uh, engage in to be able to have um, feedback and dialogue. I know some folks wanted to do this at a different time. Uh, please know that we're trying our very best to accommodate so many things. And I want to thank all of you who were able to join today. Um, and uh, let's continue to have grace with each other. Let's continue to, to think outside of the box because these are certainly uh, times that uh, we're writing the history books as we're living this situation. May I, so, may I ask just one question? I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, who's and I probably am not going to be popular, but who's speaking? Would, it's Heidi Bling. Okay. I would like to know if there will be an option of keeping our classes together if we are willing to do both hybrid and distance, because I can see a way to organize <gasps> that for myself that would work for me. And I, Ms., uh, Dr. Fisher, I saw Mrs. Wood. I believe she might have been headed over to um, Mrs. Huerta's office to, to respond. I see. We were just a, a little bit to, yes, there she is. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure. Um, I just want to remind everyone that Heidi teaches sixth grade. Her students are very much more independent. Um, that is not that is not a model that is recommended anywhere, not even at the state level, to have teachers trying to manage a classroom and teaching distance learning. Just, um, I'm just going to put my two cents in there. <laughs> Thank you, though, Heidi. <laughs> I mean, I know it could work. Maybe it, it, I'm certainly sure some it'll work for some people. I just um, and I I I didn't mean to make everybody. I know, know, I know, and I heard you. I heard your disclaimer at the beginning, and I and I, I, I teach fifth. <laughs> oh, fifth. Sorry, you moved. Sorry. Ms. Wood, okay, Miss um, Wood, did you want to respond at all in any way? Um, no, I'm sorry. I was actually transitioning offices, and I did not actually hear the question. Uh, I, I wanted to make a separate comment to our um, our classified union. Uh, just so you're aware, what uh, Suda did was that they they received questions, uh, just a ton of questions. I think Roxanne said 19 different pages of questions, and then their leadership team um, uh, summarized those and sent us questions that we're going to work on answering. Um, so 
there's no way we can answer every single question in the chat, uh, but if CSEA wanted to do something similar, I'm sure some of the questions are going to be very similar and then some unique to classic. Uh, but um, again, it would be your responsibility to summarize those and compile them so you're not, uh, we're not getting 20 of the same questions. Correct. We would be happy to address those as well for our classified uh, staff members. That's what I had wanted to say. And I apologize, I did not uh, hear Heidi's question. Heidi, would you like to restate your question? I'm glad I'm distant so nobody can hurt me. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, by grace, Heidi. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, um, I feel pretty comfortable with technology and I can see in my head a way to organize it so I could actually teach the hybrid and the distance students and keep my class together. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that that would work for everyone and I'm not suggesting that everyone should have to do that, but I'm wondering if I would be able to have an option to do that, should I choose to. Um, Heidi, why don't you, uh, why don't we do a Google Meet and you share that with me? Um, because uh, you're not the first teacher to approach me on that and um, um, so you're not alone. <laughs> So uh, I would love to hear those ideas and then put them forth to other people. Uh, again, this is why we uh, negotiate the effects of things like this. And, and um, I, for one, am open to uh, any out of the box thinking because uh, we are trying to navigate this, you as educators, uh, you as support staff and us as administrators, when um, this is uncharted territory for all of us. Uh, so I am very, very open to the ideas, and I would love to hear what's in your head. Uh, so uh, perhaps if you wouldn't mind, if we could just do a Google Meet and you share that with me, and then um, I'll very definitely present ideas to others. Thank you so um, much. And um, I'm going to honor your time, but there was a question about A and PM for everyone. We can't do that because of the instructional minute requirements. And, um, and so that was why we had to limit that to the TKK um, based on the instructional minutes. But I wanna thank everyone um, for your comments and for joining us today. Uh, our executive team will get together, we'll review the questions in the chat. I reviewed every page of the uh, questions that were received and tried to make sure that they were uh, addressed or uh, responses were someplace in our presentation today but we'll review them again to make sure that um, we have a response for any that were missed. Okay, this information again will be posted to the website, correct, Norma? Yes, I was gonna share that just like we did for the parent, um, I believe I thought we checked it this morning or this afternoon, just uh, we did record this meeting, so it will be posted. We do have the PowerPoint already um, posted, I believe, and then we will be keeping the chat so that we have um, the information that we can respond to um, as Dr. Fisher has spoken to, so yes. Okay, well again, thank you everyone, and we appreciate your hard work, and we appreciate your thoughts, and most importantly, we, we appreciate your flexibility as we work together to do the very best we can in navigating our current situation. Think good thoughts about October 13th, okay? Have a nice afternoon. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.